Welcome to Housemans and an evening focusing on a very timely and I think it's fair to say very important new book, The Revenge of the Real, Politics for a Post-Pandemic World, which has just been published yesterday, in fact, by Verso. This is a book that asks the question, can the world govern itself differently? When COVID-19 exposed the pre-existing conditions of the current global crisis, Many Western states failed to protect their populations. Others were able to suppress the virus only with sweeping social restrictions. In contrast, many Asian countries made much more precise interventions. But everywhere, lockdown transformed everyday life, introducing an epidemiological view of society based on sensing, modeling, and filtering. So what lessons can we learn from this? Well, what the revenge of the real envisions is, as we're going to hear this evening, is a new positive biopolitics that recognizes that governance is literally a matter of life and death, and that multiple interconnected dilemmas have to be addressed on a planetary scale. So instead of thinking of biotechnologies as something imposed on society, the book asks, can we see them as essential to a politics of infrastructure, knowledge, and direct intervention? And if we do, can we build a society based on a new rationality of inclusion, care, and prevention? Our guest tonight is the author of The Revenge of the Real, Benjamin Bratton, in conversation with Nick Cernick. Benjamin Bratton is professor of visual arts at the University of California, San Diego, and program director of the terraforming think tank at Strelka Institute of Media, Architecture, and Design in Moscow. Benjamin is author of a number of acclaimed books, including The Stack on Software and Sovereignty, which develops a comprehensive political philosophy of planetary scale computation. Nick Cernick, very pleased to have him in conversation with Benjamin this evening, is lecturer in digital economy at King's College London. And many of you will know he's co-author with Alex Williams of Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism and a World Without Work that was published by Verso and also author of Platform Capitalism published by Polity. And with Helen Hester, Nick is currently writing After Work, The Fight for Free Time, which Nick has confirmed will be published by Verso next year. So thank you for joining us virtually at Housemans. We're a proudly independent bookshop whose doors first opened in 1945 and we've been based in King's Cross in London since 1959. Housemans, for those of you who are joining us from around the world and have never been in the physical shop, uh, we're a bookshop that specializes in books, magazines, and periodicals of radical interest and progressive politics, focusing on subjects such as feminism, black politics and identity, LGBTQIA perspectives, the environment, socialism, and anarchism. We reopened to the public in April after a year spent selling a whole lot of books by mail order to people all around the world. Our doors are open again now, but our mail order business is still in operation too. So for anyone who's unable to visit us in person, we warmly invite you to order your copy of The Revenge of the Real at www.housemans.com. So this evening is part of our ongoing program of events featuring authors and subjects as important as this evening's. We send out a monthly email newsletter with details of these upcoming events, book clubs, and other Houseman's news. So if you'd like to be kept informed and you'd like to subscribe, just send an email to shop at houseman's.com with subscribe to newsletter as the subject line, and we'll take care of the rest. So as far as tonight goes, our event will run um, between an hour and an hour and a half, but definitely um, concluding by half past eight, that's UK time. And once I disappear from the screen, our speakers will get stuck into conversation and they'll be also engaging with the always excellent questions from our houseman's audience. You guys are the best in town and possibly other towns too. Um, so if you've got a question for Benjamin and Nick, please put it in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. That's the Q and A box, not the chat box. Um, be sure to put it in the Q&A so they will see it. Um, and our speakers will do their best to get to as many of your queries and contributions as they can in the time we've got. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. 
uh, really proud to be launching the book here in the UK. And as we know, for many, many people who are attending from around the world. So thank you very much. And over to you, Benjamin and Nick. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for uh, for the Housemans for for hosting hosting this event. Um, really, very much looking forward to sharing some of the, the this work with you all. Um, several other th more thanks are due as well. First of all, to Verso for for the um, their shepherding of this. Leo Hollis for uh, commissioning the the uh, the book in the first place. Um, to Meta Haven for another brilliant uh, book cover. Uh, Strelka Mag for publishing the original version of the of the essay uh, and several other people uh, along the way. Also, so most of my thanks to Nick for uh, for joining today and for um, entering into some conversation about the about about the book and about some of the ideas that uh, are that are at stake for it. So the way in which we sort of planned this is, I'm going to make a little bit of a kind of introductory give some introductory remarks that in, in essence summarize some of the key ideas of the book for those who may may uh, not be as familiar familiar with it. Um, and then Nick and I are going to he's prepared a number of of really, I, I think, important and interesting questions that will push the conversation in a, even further. Uh, so he and I will be in a little dialogue and then we'll open it up to everyone and we can we which will be the usually the the most rewarding part of the whole the whole exercise. So let me just begin. Um, the as we hopefully uh, are rotating towards what we might colloquially call the post-pandemic era, uh, we must now uh, ask what happened uh, and why. Uh, what did the pandemic reveal about how we organize uh, how we organize societies uh, that must inform change? Where to start? Well, first, the we might say that the world's population um, has involuntarily uh, uh, participated in perhaps the largest ever experiment in comparative governance. Uh, the virus was the control variable, uh, and different responses by different governments, different political cultures uh, can now be uh, evaluated, should be evaluated. And what doesn't work? Uh, in dealing with planetary issues uh, such as this must inform what comes next. We saw that some countries were more effective than others, regardless of factors like uh, per capita income, that issues of political culture in many, in many cases were more decisive. One of the things then I think that has had, what has been exposed was that the, what the pandemic exposed was an underlying and deeper ongoing crisis of governance in Western societies, perhaps particularly the United States and UK, uh, Brazil, India. Um, uh, but in the United States in particular, where even you know, access to healthcare is, is privatized, um, we were uh, the, the, the arrangements of a, of a response, regardless of the size of our economy, proved to be uh, inadequate for any number of reasons that we'll try to unpack over the course of the next few uh, days, weeks, and years. There weren't enough masks. There wasn't enough testing capacity. The plans were haphazard. People preferred misinformation. Coordination was politicized. The pandemic was a crisis, but our response, uh, not only the government's responses, were in many ways as big of a disaster. Another way of putting this is that as the virus spread, uh, as we mapped the virus, uh, it also mapped us. Uh, one lesson to be learned, as, as was mentioned, is what I call the epidemiological view of society. The, the pandemic made us realize that not just during a pandemic, but that, that always, that society cannot be understood, um, can be thought, cannot just be thought of as a dynamic between individuals versus the state or individuals versus the collective. There's something more fundamental uh, in our biological, biochemical uh, circumstance that must, be, uh, that must be accounted for and must be reprioritized. And so rather, or despite the culturalist blusterings of populist leaders, underneath lies something quite fundamental and non-negotiable, a biological, biochemical, and biopolitical interconnectedness that has always been planetary in scale. 
The pandemic has hopefully shattered the illusion that one can simply ignore this reality with the kind of populist politics whose rise we've witnessed over the past decade in, as said, for example, the US, the UK, Russia, Brazil, India, and elsewhere. The world is actually not just a text. This is the revenge of the real. So we should not, cannot really return to the same normal uh, that made us so ill-prepared. That would finally mean that the effort was for nothing. Um, and so this effort, this, this realization in a way is not really just about the pandemic, it's about something deeper. Consider by example, the culture war over masks. I think that in many ways, the people who choose not to be part of the uh, immunological commons, let's say, uh, by flamboyantly refusing masks are expressing uh, not just a kind of simple selfishness, but rather a deeper particular understanding of society as foremost a collection of autonomous actors who choose or choose not to enter into subsequent cultural, social, or economic exchanges. This is the model that underwrites this logic. And if that is the case, then for them, individual is proper, risk is properly individual, not collective. For them, my exhale is never their inhale. However, this internalized model of society <clears throat> is not only wrong during a crisis, um, but a crisis does make, uh, show, does make it obvious just how wrong uh, it really is. Social relations are not simply generated by collections of individuals. Individuals are generated by their social relations. This has always been the case. It was the case before modernity. It was so in the 20th century, and it is so today. And so to, in sum then, post-pandemic politics, as said, is a kind of revenge of the real, um, and hopefully in a, in a, in a productive sense. Uh, it is that non-negotiable reality that upends comfortable illusions, no matter how hard some might try to push back with their chosen form of magic. The difficult lessons to be learned are those that come when reality in the form of a virus, our vulnerability to it, our inadequate governing responses to it, crashes through the comforting illusions and ideologies. The pandemic is it once more an eruptive revelation of the complex biological reality of the planet with which we are entangled. And that underlying reality is apathetic to the plot lines and mythic lessons that we may try to project upon it. This doesn't mean that we can't know it, that we can't grasp it, that we can't make sense of it, model it, or respond to it. We can, we can do all these things as it is, not as we imagine, would want to, want to imagine it to be. In the most fundamental sense, this is really the definition of governance that I'm trying to, that I would, would put forward, that, that, that should have animated a pandemic politics and should underwrite the post-pandemic politics that we must compose now. We need to build, we have to build a politics capable of engagement with the full complexity of, of, of the real. The pre-existing conditions that have now been exposed clarify the need for geopolitics based not on the self-undermining prisoners dilemma tactics in the face of common risks, but on the deliberate plan for the coordination of a planetarity that we occupy, that we make and remake over and again, deliberately and, re and with reason. Otherwise, this moment will be an unnecessarily permanent emergency. And so, we must understand post-pandemic politics, both in terms of how the state interacts with society, as well as in terms of how society that is utterly and always planetary in scope, knows itself, models itself, and attempts to compose, organize, and care for itself through whatever mechanisms it can, be they public, personal, private, scientific. In other words, to, to conclude, we need a planetary competency. And so those are some of the ideas at a sort of higher level that the book tries to address. It's my pleasure then to sort of pass the, the talking stick over to, over to Nick, who um, uh, has been a, a rather uh, observant reader of, of my work. And I look forward to the, to the conversation that we might have. Great. Um, thank you, Benjamin, for that um, really nice summary of the book.
Um, yeah, I want to sort of say at the beginning that uh, you know I think the book is a really interesting provocation in terms of what should come after the pandemic, um, what can be learned from the pandemic, um, and also a really interesting analysis of what had gone wrong. Like fundamentally, Western countries have failed in numerous ways, um, and I think there's a really interesting thesis within the book about why exactly that's happened, um, connected with political changes that have happened in the past uh, decade or so. Um, so it is a really interesting book in many, many ways, and I encourage you to read it. It's nice, it's short, um, very readable, and it also has some great polemics against um, various figures, including Giorgio Agamben, um, which are worth reading in themselves. Um, what I want to talk about today in our discussion now uh, broadly covers three themes. So I want to talk about surveillance as one of the key themes of the book. Um, I want to talk about capitalism as um, uh, something which is raised at points within the book, but not explicitly thematized as such. And maybe think about how that might be combined with ideas within the book. And then finally, sort of returning to the core theme of, um, uh, of Benjamin's book, The Stack, which is geopolitics. Um, and sort of think about what, how we might consider geopolitics in light of the pandemic and how we might consider it um, in light of this book. Um, all that being said, um, if anybody has any questions, uh, do feel free to type them into the Q&A section. Uh, if they're particularly relevant to what we're discussing at the moment, uh, I'll try and incorporate them and we can discuss them right away. Otherwise, we'll have time at the end, about 20, 30 minutes at least, uh, to take questions from the audience and we can discuss all of that. So um, the first theme I want to pick up on is surveillance, which is something uh, which runs throughout the book. And I think there's a really trenchant critique of recent discourse around surveillance, which has become a sort of key word for unpacking what the problems of big technology are today. Um, and it's become a, a common sense about what is fundamentally wrong with big tech um, and what needs to be fixed in order to sort of get a better, uh, a better mode of technology. Now, Benjamin's book, however, takes a really interesting critique of that line. So just as a sort of opening you know, gambit, I'd like you to sort of unpack some of that critique, which you find flawed within this notion of surveillance, and then something which you sort of gesture towards in the book, but don't necessarily speak about too much, but the, the sort of apex of the surveillance discourse, which is Shoshana Zuboff's work on surveillance capitalism. So how does your sort of critique of surveillance fit in maybe with Zuboff's work and um, yeah. what, what's fundamentally wrong with these issues? Good, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate it. This this is a this is a section of the book that's been kind of interestingly. Um, I found it to sort of like highly controversial with some audiences and not at all controversial with other audiences, and it's not what I would have expected. Uh, and so I appreciate the opportunity to sort of maybe to kind of clarify the the, the point. Um, the argument that I'm making is not that surveillance is good. It's not that these people, that we've, we've learned the surveillance is bad and now we need to rotate this and understood that, that maybe it's okay. The, the, the argument really, in a sense, boils down to that we might think of the question of what do we really mean by governance uh, in a broad sense, like uh, not just in state institutions, but really the condition by which societies might choose, how they may choose to compose themselves and li to liberate the collective reason by which this might happen. Um, not simply through, not only through institutional mechanisms, but that part of this and way we need to think about this is, is inevitably, is not reducible to, but almost inevitably must include the process by which a society is able to sense, make sense of itself, model itself, and act back upon itself with these models, uh, however abstract or specific or granular they may be, in such a way that it, that this this compositional recursivity, let's say, um, has some chance of the kind of success that it that it that it that, that it may that it may have. The point I would want to put forward is that is that at this point in time, we are that the, as you've mentioned, the kind of commonsensical critique of surveillance, which we now not only find in 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 sort of from from leftist positions, but all the way through to the the Atlantic and the New York Times and the entire sort of Atlantic legal establishment is sort of Zuboff, including Zuboff of has, books of the yeah, has kind of embraced this. Uh, and I think in a certain ways, um, some of that may have to do with the idea that um, uh, 
you know, the fact that large scale technical systems are in, in, in uh, sort of embody forms of, of effective de facto sovereignty that legal systems used to be able to monopolize, it's not surprising that those legal systems would find this uh, unnatural. But the point I was sort of making is that that going forward, thinking about this capacity for society to model itself and act back upon itself and think of this in epidemiological terms, if we use the term surveillance and all of its sort of pernicious Foucauldian panopticon connotations as the only language through which we are able to adjudicate what kinds of sensing and modeling and data production are appropriate, this already in advance sort of kneecaps the conversation, all of the kinds of conversations that we need to have. So uh, let me be a little more specific in relation to the pandemic. Like one of the things I talk about in the book is what I call the sensing layer, that there are ways in which cities and states and societies like had some capacity to actually sense and make sense of what was going on and produce viable models. Um, others didn't, others were left basically blind. And because they were left blind, they were the only intervention that was possible was the blunt, all, you know, blunt blanket remedy of a, of a, of a pervasive lockdown because no one knew really what was going on. Societies that had really, really poor sensing layers were ones that turned, um, that turned sports stadiums into, into makeshift, makeshift morgues. We, we need to be able to understand that, that thinking about this question of, of, of what constitutes like the proper forms of sensing. One of the other arguments I make is that we need to sort of de-dichotomize notions of high tech forms of sensing and high touch forms of sensing. Like when I talk about the sensing layer, I don't just mean chips. I also mean, you know, the nurse who is there and is drawing, taking a blood sample, uh, that public health clinic in a, uh, in a you know, poor part of the county that is actually, that makes testing available to people. The, uh, the general and ubiquitous available of availability of testing is not something we had in the United States. Our public health system was organized around that, that you know that that the if you had the capital you can have access to the health, to the to the, uh, to the health system this means the health system is unable to create like uh, accurate 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 models because the accurate models need to be equitable so all of which is to say um, is that uh, we need to have a we, surveillance cannot be the only world we use we need to have a bigger and broader conversation about what kinds of sensing is appropriate what kinds of sensing is required so there's kind of two problems here one is there are ways in which the current system, and you know, honestly, I agree with 75% of, of Zuboff's critique of the current system. Like I'm not many sense, you know, uh, the last, I, I think that the use of planetary scale computation primarily for the modeling and tracking and prediction of individual consumer behavior is a world historical own goal. Like we are misusing this capacity on, on in, in like in a way I can't imagine more, more perniciously. My, my, the problem I would sort of where I would sort of differ from her is that her the response that we get from sort of the critique of surveillance capitalism is one that is more or less sort of focused on the individual user still as it's kind of this primary actor within the system. What do I mean by that? There are lots of other ways in which planetary scale computation can be used and is used. Climate science is a, is a like a great is another example. Climate science the very idea of climate change itself is an epistemological accomplishment of planetary scale computation. Without this vast sensing and modeling and simulation capacity, we don't have the idea of we don't have the idea of climate change. Climate science is not focused on individual humans, individual behaviors, individual actions, everything else. It's focused on the larger dynamics and flows of complex systems. Um, this is it. This is its. It, this is its advantage. So is, by the way, is is most of you know the kind of epidemiological science. And so the argument, it, it, in a certain sense, I'm, I'm suggesting is that that if we are focusing specific, that, that we need to sort of shift the logic of what constitutes the appropriate use of data away from this kind of hyper-individuated prediction and towards things that actually sort of matter more. So there's two questions. One is there's the improper use of data by improper actors for improper means. This needs to be politicized. There is also the absence of the proper use, the proper production of data by proper, by proper things for proper purposes. The lack of access to testing, for example, is more, the, is more of the second. Zuboff, however, not to put too fine of a, a, a point on it, um, is, is reduces the question again to like, what is the proper relation that the whole question about, about 
the production of data and the use of data more generally is, what is the proper relationship between the autonomous self-sovereign individual who enters into contractual relationships with big platforms and how can that self-sovereign individual with their private data and their private relationships be properly counter-weaponized in relationship to these pernicious, these pernicious relationships with. The problem is the individuation itself. The problem is the use of planetary scale computation for this in, 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 the, in, in, this, in, in this way. Unless we sort of like shift the mechanism more broadly away from that, um, the real de deleterious effects that she rightly points out are going to, are going to stay with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that goes in quite well with um, the, the question that's come up um, from Eric Meyer, um, who says, Dear Benjamin, how do you think about the relation of politics to society's sensing layer, the capacity to model itself and act back upon itself? Are the three former aspects neutral and only the question, uh, only the question of the normative, uh, the question of how to act back, given the empirical model should be a matter of politics, and thus only this normative dimension should be politically contested? Uh, and if it's more complicated, if these three aspects and politics are intertwined, how do we direct our political contestation without disregarding all the positive possibilities um, that these aspects could make possible? Uh, which I think, yeah, it gets quite nicely to the, the mm. one of the one of the challenges that you pose precisely that the fact that yep. this technology can be used for different um, reasons. And, you know, is it fundamentally flawed or is it just a sort of a normative issue of use? Um, it, it depends on the technology and it depends on what we, you know, the sort of the context. I mean, it, it's a, if I follow the entire sort of line of the question, um, there are, I mean, one of the things I think needs to be sort of held is that even the data is produced more than it is extracted. Like it, it's not that data exists in the world as sort of like strawberries and we go out in the, in the world and pick it. And then this question would do the data is produced in the act of modeling. And part of the normative question has to do not just with what do we do with data once it's made, but how what is the data that is relevant to produce in the production of the model of the, the production of the model of the world itself. And so at the very beginning, there is, I, I mean, I guess I wouldn't separate the normative question from the political question in this regard. And maybe that's I didn't maybe I didn't get quite get the gist of the question, but the 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 normative question over the like what are the what are the models of the world that society will require in order to properly compose itself is both a, is a normative question, a political question and a technological question simultaneously. Um, I, I would, I basically, what I would suggest it, it maybe in sort of regard is that it's the diff, it is that the, the different, the position of agency within this can be, is obviously distributed between the particular affordances of particular kinds of technical systems. Uh, and the normative intentionality of the people that use them. It works backwards and forwards. There, there, I, I'm not making an argument that is, it's certainly not a kind of te technological solutionist argument. That is, if we deploy this technology more, like more technology, more better. Um, the question absolutely has to do with a transformation in the mobilization of this general capacity of the extensional sapience that we have in the world through this technology for purposes that are that that would be better served, and I think better served is a is a is a normative question. At the same time, there's, I'm also not making, and I wouldn't recommend anyone to make what, the conversion of a kind of political solutionist approach, which would somehow imagine that the that the questions of 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 capacity and valuation and 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 direction for all of this can be can be determined entirely discursively and agonistically um, with no reference to or comprehension of the always existent sort of underlying technical reality that makes the posing of those questions possible, uh, the questions of those possible in the first place. Um, I, I think that dynamic is one in which, I mean, I think in the longer run, there's, a, um, I think the next several decades within political science and international relations more generally are going to be marked by a kind of a kind of technological turn as the the question of the political and the question of the economic comes to understand the ways in which it always has been um, co-determined and co-contextualized by it, the particular technical relations that make it possible and that those technical relations in a way not only sort of produce the conditions of possibility, but they end up producing, transforming uh, 
uh, tra transforming the, the what comes to constitute the um, uh, the proper direction for those for, for those disciplines and those approaches. Yeah, yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Um, I mean, in, in IR, there's you know this notion of um, weaponized interdependence that has emerged recently. Um, it's sort of an interesting yeah. thinking of these these various interconnections um, on both you know an economic level, but a technological level uh, as well. Whether it be you yep. know the, the the financial infrastructure of the world, um, to give one sort of relevant example. For, um, for sure, which are which which is not you can't separate. You've never we have never been able to separate what we might call a financial infrastructure from the technical construction of, of the world around us. I mean, it's part of how this works. So, I mean, long story short, it's this, it's like, we want to unravel this dichotomization of the social from the technological uh, in the same way we would have unraveled a nature culture dichotomy and like the, we, let's, let's get, let's, let's get over it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, this leads on nicely to my next question, um, which, so this comes from your Planetary Sapiens essay, which came out recently. Oh, yeah. um, and it, you know, it builds on some of the same themes from the book as well. But I think you pose it quite interesting there, because you raise the question of, in your words, what is planetary scale computation for? Uh, and I right. think this is a really nice question, because it, it sort of gets to the heart of a lot of the issues that you're talking about. Um, and it implies, I think, a number of interesting challenges. Um, we'll get into some of that when we discuss capitalism, which I think is one of the major hurdles for thinking about what is planetary computation for, but it also sort of, um, uh, there's a sort of, you know, another critique as well, which is the, you know, this is this technological determinist school of thought, which says that technology has its mind of its own, its sort of agency of its own, that it's once, you know, particular technology is created, society is then shaped uh, inevitably by it. Um, now nobody, most people at least don't really believe in that sort of hardcore technological determinism anymore. But there are some interesting ideas um, around things like path dependency and momentum from people like Thomas Hughes, mm -hmm. who discuss yep. large technical systems sort of taking on this, this sort of weight of their own. And I think that's interesting in terms of this question, of what is planetary yep. computation for? Because it is a large scale technical system. And does it generate its own sort of momentum? Um, what might that momentum be? Uh, does it generate, you know, particular interests which have goals that are necessarily, well, not necessarily, but maybe um, opposed to what we might, you know, reasonably want the system to do? Um, and I think one good example of all of this is something like um, uh, the mission creep of data collection. And this is sort of yeah. a common phenomenon whenever a government starts to collect data is that they start to collect more and more and more data. Um, and it just becomes, you know, sort of growing thing. Uh, we see it with the tech companies as well, you know, they just collect data because maybe it'll have some future potential use. Um, and once they're able to do it, you know, they just continue to, to sort of expand um, their data extraction apparatus. Um, so data, it, data, think, data production apparatus. Data. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and I think to give one example of this from the coronavirus pandemic, uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan is a good example because they had a very, you know, quite, um, uh, data rich response to the pandemic. Uh, they managed to handle it in very sort of reasonable ways. Um, but what they found happening a year after introducing various, you know, measures, emergency measures um, to, to, to track citizens and use their data, what they're finding now is that the government is now expanding that data extraction without asking citizens, without telling them what this data is being used for and, you know, what they're collecting. And so I think mm -hmm. this all goes back to the sort of issue of, you know, what is planetary scale computation for? And mm -hmm. is there the sort of, you know, once you build up a large technical system, does it take on a mind of its own in, in some sense? Yeah, so so good. thank you for the, there's a, a lot in here and I think we could, we could spend a lot of time trying to, I, I think there's a lot of essential questions here and we could spend a lot of time trying to give them due, their, their, give their, their proper due. So I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, the argument that I'm making really is just to, just to be clear is not on behalf of that you know more mega structure more better that that we that if we just if we just had bigger computers if we just had more computation then all of this would kind of sort all of this would kind of sort itself out I'm also not arguing that there is a kind of intrinsic rationality in digital computation and that the great the more that we sort of acquiesce to this intrinsic rationality the more that we'll kind of sort it out I, I think sometimes where 
You know, one of the things, I mean, I think you know this probably, probably quite well as well. Like one of the things about writing books that are a little bit orthogonal to a particular common sense is that you, you spend a lot of time discussing what people presume you must have, you presume you must, must have meant rather than what you actually very explicitly wrote. Um, and I don't, I, what, what I, the things that I'm suggesting that I, um, th those may are more uh, common in, in misinterpretations. The question of, um, uh, of what planetary scale computation is for is, again, I don't think is, is, I don't mean this as a hypothetical question or something that can be postponed. I think, again, like looking at climate science and earth science, the whole history of planetary scale computation provides, I think, a number of already existing uh, alternative paths that could be made more or less dependent in this way. In other words, the question of path dependency um, cuts both ways. It can be good or bad. Like there's a path dependency by which you get a kind of plat a kind of larger lock-in effect that it be becomes very difficult for something to get off of. There's also ways, as we've seen for the development of, of the role of, of computation and the, and the uh, complexification of, of simulations of past, present, and future climate science, this becomes the basis of, a, of, a, of an ongoing multi-generational scientific collaboration that's also a kind of path dependency lock-in. And so the question of what it's for, it doesn't mean that how do we avoid lock, how do we avoid path dependencies, but in fact, how do we, is there a way to compose them sort of more deliberately or to tip the scales in such a way that would that is more deliberate rather than presuming that there is this kind of emergent reality that's just going to happen on its own that like that that somehow the planlessness will save us because emergent spontaneity whether that's market effects or mutualism is all that we really need this is this is i think part of this I mean, there's other histories of this, these kinds of, of the, the history of planetary scale computation that is probably instructive here. We have, a, we have a project this year at the Strelka Institute that's looking at, that's comparing the sort of the relationship between a kind of um, geopolitical cosmology and the development of particular large scale technical infrastructures and the ways in which these kind of work. And so the one, one they're looking at is the Trans-Siberian Railway, all the ways in which the Soviet Union had sort of imagined this would allow for a kind of enclosed, uh, an, an enclosed, uh, enclosed economy, uh, and after containerization, uh, it actually opened up the economy to outside forces in ways that it never would have been able to otherwise. In other words, there's a plan, and then it goes upside down. The other thing we're looking at, in the way in which the the infrastructure does end up having an agency that is to some extent unpredictable, but I, I don't know that that's that doesn't mean that that doesn't disqualify it. It just means that's part of what the reality. There's also I think looking at the history of Soviet cybernetics, Chinese cybernetics, Western cybernetics at the early beginning of this as well. There were a no, there are all kinds of ideological claims about what cybernetics meant in the 1950s from from it, from U.S. Cold War think tanks, from from the pre-Khrushchev, post-Khrushchev versions of cybernetics in Soviet Union. The Sino-Soviet conflict was it, the, the role of cybernetics it, within this as to whether or not this would be acceptable or not acceptable. And then there was the emergence over the 70s and 80s of, of, a kind of, of the kind of computational infrastructure that was being imagined that ended up having effects that none of these would have imagined taking place. And the rise of the recent rise of over the last decade or so of, of China as an economic player probably being the most obvious uh, to, to there as well. And so, there is a complexity to this that um, that needs to be given given its due weight, I, I, it, and 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 in terms both analytically and 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 and, compos and compositionally. Now, I, I know I'm I'm skimming really just skimming this because it's a very important question. But to the, the question of Taiwan and the data creep around around, around this as well. Um, so first of all, I think that there's a presumption that many of the ways in which the Asian technocracies were able to succeed to the extent to which they were able to succeed in relation to each other was primarily dependent upon their acquiescence to data technology. Um, and while that, you know, Audrey Tang's plan in, 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 in Taiwan was particularly impressive, um, it wasn't really just that. It was also that there was a kind of, that there is a, the, the structures of a public health system, that there was a culture of governance, that there was a, 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 a trust in the logic of this, the trust that was sort of to do. But what this allowed for was, I mean, it's kind of amazing to think about in this way is that, you know, Taiwan didn't really have to close down its schools and it didn't sort of close the businesses. It was able to keep things going and open because of the granularity of these kinds of, of ability to map and to intervene precisely. It was the countries that like the US or, you know, 
perhaps the UK, that is kind of pulling the Band-Aid off as slowly and painfully and gruesomely as possible by not really dealing with the pandemic directly, not really not dealing with it, just extending it as long as possible, are ones in which the citizenships have probably, th those are the citizens who have probably experienced the pandemic as the greatest loss of personal freedom uh, of, of all, uh, Brazil being the kind of worst, the worst case example. Okay, now to your question about the data creep though, I think part of this has to do is that we're not actually taking the question of data, a question of modeling, a, 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 the role of data in governance seriously. Uh, there is no like actual vi longer term vision of what its proper role should be. So we end up making these kind of tactical decisions on a case by case basis of what we're going to grab or not grab without really any big picture of why it would, why it would, uh, why it would need to sort of happen. I'm of the opinion that, you know, and so that leaves the big capitalist platforms as the only one with a long-term plan as to what it is that we're going to be using this data for, because the question is sort of deferred within the public, within the public conversation as being one either of, basically of the less you know, the better. The, the, more, the less the government knows about the society in which it's being asked to govern, the better that will work. And I, I, I think that is, I, I, I don't think that's sustainable in the long term. I, I think to a certain extent that that is a logic of governance that comes from both from the neoliberal era, the, like the, the more that we kind of like remove governance and allow spontaneous emergence to run the economy, the better. From the left, like the, a kind of post May 68 endemic suspicion of, 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 of the state and authoritarian, authoritarian author, you know, the state as an intrinsically authoritarian intervention. So what we need is actually like, you know, to understand that, that, that quantitative and qualitative models are part of what, of what society needs to be able to compose itself and a bigger plan and a bigger picture and a deeper, deeper and more uh, generous conversation of what, the, the, what, what will work, what we want, what we want to, what data we want to be producing has to be, have it, has to be had. So that both sides of the problem, like that we're not just that we're, we are producing the wrong data, you know, accidentally or perniciously, but that we also are producing the data that we do need, which we're not, uh, actually, actually is able to happen. Then you have some criteria by which you can decide that in, in the, you know, it, with a big picture perspective that we shouldn't be, this, this data creep is actually, is illegitimate, whereas this, what some might call data creep in this case is really, you know, more about you know, a longer term archive of the way in which the society might work. And like the fact that we don't know what this data is going to be useful for in the future, that's kind of the promise of the archive more generally. Like we're, we're, make, we're producing an accounting of the present so that the future can produce, you know, sort of long term samples of, of long term trends. Unless we're participating in the production of the data as a point, an analysis of these long term trends, such as climate change, will not be possible in the future. But you know, so I, I, so the, the the bigger picture is like, is this it, the having this more I think more generous and honest um, understanding of what what's at stake here will allow for these smaller decisions to be more contextually or contextually um, uh, discussed and contested. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting as well. Sort of, you know, we've got to this moment where um, surveillance being the ultimate sort of critique and privacy being the ultimate value to protect at all costs. Um, but actually, there is this, this sort of undercurrent of leftist history of actually using data to, to fight the powers that be. Um, so, you know, there's sort of counter mapping. Or to, or, to, or, to, or to be the powers that be. Yeah, 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 exactly as well. Um, and actually, you know, Dubois, for instance, was one of the first um, major data visualizers um, and has some really incredible pieces of work that, you know, using data. Uh, math uh, math isn't system. the problem. Math is not the problem. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to tell that sort of counter history, I think, at some point, and particularly against, Absolutely. Um, the dominance yes. of surveillance uh, discourse today. Um, so this brings me on to sort of the next key theme that I want to bring up, um, which maybe gets to um, Eric's question as well, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. Um, right. But this is a key theme of capitalism, um, which mm -hmm. I, know, I know in personal conversation with you, you know, you've sort of um, uh, said that, you, you know, your own work on geopolitics needs an economist, a political economist, to match um, that sort of work in thinking about um, uh, the ways in which technologies and uh, the cloud in general, the stack, um, is changing things. Um, so I know sure. your political economy is not your primary primary uh, area. 
Um, but I think at the same time, thinking about capitalism is really important to a lot of the questions that you raise. I agree. Um, and in particular, the core argument I would take from your book um, is that the response to coronavirus uh, has to be biopolitical in a positive sense. And, you know, it's the sort of, it's the, it's the argument that runs through all of these arguments about surveillance, the critiques of populism, the critiques of Agamben, um, is that yep. biopolitics um, can be taken in a positive sense. And in fact, we have to take it in a positive sense. Um, so you set yourself against the now familiar negative critique of biopolitics, which stems from a certain reading of Foucault's work. Um, but the question that I want to pose here is, whether or not biopolitics is actually the appropriate or best framework for understanding both the de facto COVID response and the future ideal response. Uh, so in particular, I want to draw upon an argument from uh, made by Joshua Clover in a book, or, uh, a short piece called The Rise and Fall of Biopolitics, uh, where he responds to Bruno Latour's arguments about biopolitics in the context of coronavirus. Um, but in this piece, Clover reminds us that the forces that were mobilized against lockdowns weren't just conspiracy theorists and populists, but they were also capitalists. Um, and I think this is really important for understanding the particular responses by governments, that it wasn't just a denial of science and it wasn't just a denial of reality, but in fact, it was a conscious choice that the economy is more important than, um, you know, 100,000 lives. Yes. So, while the COVID response may seem like a paradigmatic case of biopolitical power, you know, this power to make live and let die, it was in fact, according to Clover, and I, I find it quite convincing, it was in fact the demands of the capitalist system of political economy, which largely determined government responses to the virus. Uh, so as Clover puts it in the piece, the sovereign is not sovereign, rather he is subordinated entirely to the dictates of capitalist, of political economy. So, is um, biopolitics the appropriate framework, or is this sort of political economy approach uh, a necessary supplement to? Um, I think it, I, I'm very, I totally welcome it as a necessary supplement. Um, you know, there, there will be, without, without pushback, there will be, um, you know, there'll be a lot of books written about the pandemic, most of them horrible, of course, um, but ones that one that would make the argument that you're kind of suggesting would be would be one that would be worth worth worth, worth further developing. Um, I, you know, I think there's a you know maybe a more philosophical question to be had about whether or not what we're talking about in terms of political economy actually does whether there's a way of understanding what we might mean by the biopolitical that would be inclusive of questions of 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 oikos and the ec economic in such a way that these are not even that they're not supplemental, but are in fact internal to one another. Um, and a lot of ways of entering into ent entering into, into this kind of question. Um, I share Joshua's uh, dismay with, with Bruno Latour more, more, more generally. Um, I, I think one of the way, you know, one of the, and I would say that I would volunteer that uh, the, the way, the sort of sketches, and you know, the book is not a policy, book of policy recommendation, but the sketches for what a bio, positive biopolitics may need to have in order for it to actually just kind of to qualify. Um, I, would, I would certainly entertain, you know, for quite some, you know, the idea that, that this is not possible to be realized um, in, in, other than through a, a political economy that we may today, from today's perspective, might recognize as a kind of post-capitalism. That, that in a way that the positive biopolitics may, be, but the question is in what ways are the positive bi bi biopolitics and the technical structures and systems and so socio-technical relations that constitute it, how is it like to, 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 if the technology does have some kind of momentum towards this direction, at least potentially, to what extent does that bring about the transformation in the mechanisms that would allow for that economy to happen. That is, how does the biopolitics, in order for the biopolitics to be realized, it in essence bends the political economy in its own interests in the same way that, you know, I think history shows a lot of, a lot of things of where work. Or on the other hand, just what extent does the transformation in the political economy um, away from uh, sort of, you know, a particular kind, particular kind of value form uh, circulation is this a prerequisite for a reorganization of what the modeling and composition and intervention, uh, not just in life but as life, 
uh, really means. And 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 you know, this 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 is a it, it extremely it, extremely interesting and serious kind of, of 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 conversation. One thing I might add to this is that you know what we mean by post capitalism should not. And I, I'm not you know I know you know this better than almost anyone. What what, what post capitalism might mean should not. We shouldn't default to understanding that that means what 20th century Europe thought of as the immediate alternatives to capitalism, namely mid 20th century industrial socialism or fascism. You know, Europe's past is not everyone else's future, uh, and and whatever form of political economy would be necessary in order to realize the kind of the kind of collective compositionality that I'm speaking of. It would be one that would be probably we would probably recognize as post capitalism. It's also one that we probably wouldn't recognize at all. Um, let, let me add, let me add to this a little bit on this sort of point because one of the other ways in which there is a, a, a rather specific discussion about the the and I mean there's there's a lot to say about this, but two things in particular. One of the parts in the book where I, I am making a very specific just there's a specific discussion about how the economy got kept going during this time, and it ends up being a sort of a longer discussion about what constitutes essential labor, what constitutes you know, like this return of top down industrial policy, the reliance on automation and, and the rest of this and the rest of this as well. You know, automation is an interesting sort of question and sort of question in, in this as well. Obviously, the politics of automation from a geopolitical standpoint of like from Pearl River Delta to your local Amazon warehouse to your food delivery app, th this is th this th we can no longer be thinking about the question of automation as some kind of futuristic problem. You know, I, one of the ways I think your your work has been was unfairly read was that your discussion of automation is like pointing to an already existing central reality of the way economies work was interpreted as being a, a kind of pointing towards some kind of Jetson future in which automation was going to be central and, and important. And, and the res, what this this response that somehow automate that questions of automation represent a, a deferrable projective futural problem. One of the effects of this is it makes it very difficult for the left to actually deal with automation as it actually exists now as an already existing problem because it's understood as essentially being supplemental peripheral, uh, tangential to the, to the, to the, uh, to, to, to the, to the or, order, order at hand. Um, the other thing in the book real quick that I sort of talk about in terms of this response, I mean, there's another argument to say is like, given your point about how much, uh, capital must have wanted to keep everything open and like, let the body count rise. Like basically Brazil has done is it's amazing that how much that didn't happen. In a way, like if you would ask me two years ago, like what was likely to happen? Would they close the car dealerships? Would they stop football? Would they close the tanning salons and supermarkets? Would would people like? I'm not sure they would. But the fact that that the fact that there was, again, I think the lockdowns are a symptom of policy failure, not success. But the fact that there was this kind of massive anti mobilization towards the that was able to start work with this as well demonstrated, I think, in a positive sense, that it is possible for some kind of coordinated, you know, you know mutually beneficial biopolitical action to take place, however, however awkward and messy and failed it was. And, you know, in one way, there's a chapter in the back of the book, I, I talk about the George Floyd protests a, around this, world, which is this sort of ex social explosion in the midst of you know, a kind of emergency in the midst of the emergency, a social explosion where you know, you put a bunch of people under under lock and key for a long period of time. They're going to want to, you know, they're going to want to come out. There's this aspect of it too, but there's another way of reading this. Like in addition to all of the other things, like maybe lower on the list, but in addition to all of the other things, that 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 could those could also be understood as a kind of a way in which people began to sort of feel the feel the the muscle memory of a kind of possibility for collective mobilization that now wanted to be expressed towards to be expressed towards something else and so um I, you know i don't I, it's not that i you know wish to sort of like entirely you know dismiss d dismiss uh joshua's point I, I think that there's a way there is a distinction between sovereign power biopower that i deal with in the book that has to do that, that the rest of this as well you know joshua's approach is one that is much more uh enamored of a kind of you know bottom-up an anarchist inspired, more mutualist, spontaneous response to things as well that I'm less 
you know, we, we, we don't necessarily see eye to eye and all, all of this as well, but um, to, just to just sort of sum up the, you know, the sort of the long point here as well is we need to be, the, the conceptualization of what the post-capitalism might, post -capitalism might even need to be, um, you know, there needs to be, uh, you know, there needs to be sort of a, a sort of clear and, and, you know, wide range of, of, of approaches to this, this as well. But I, I think I've made the point. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, sort of answer my next question, so I may, I may skip over it in some ways, um, but it has to do with um, uh, a, a comment that my friend Rob Lucas made to me at one point, oh, yeah. uh, made on Twitter as well, um, but that you're sort of your argument, um, I see I've gone out of focus now, but um, uh, you, that your argument about what these systems of sensing could be uh, implicitly relies upon a sort of image of society um, that's relatively devoid, at least, of particular hierarchies of class, race, gender, all these things. Um, no, I don't. Yeah, I know. I don't. I don't agree. I, I, I think there's a way in which, like, there is a kind of lock-in conception. I mean, please finish the question, but I just want to say as well, like, it's like, the, I think this goes to a certain extent about sort of the habit of a kind of really fundamental distinct, you know, sort of a differentiation of the logic of the political and the economic and the social as somehow divorced from technological the technological conditions that make it possible in the first place and so that if you are emphasizing and hypothesizing and meditating upon you know the, the capacities and directions of technological systems you must be doing so at the expense of other of other of other kinds of conditions and, and but please go ahead yeah i mean so i don't i don't think that the the I don't think the point is necessarily that aspect so much okay, as thank idea, you. this goes back again, I think, to actually Joshua's point, which is to say that, you know, what are sort of the fundamental determining conditions of social systems today? Um, and capitalism, and I would agree with Joshua and with, with Rob on this, capitalism is for me the fundamental structuring principle um, of the contemporary world. Um, and in that sense, you know, it, it fundamentally determines what technologies are used for, not to, you know, not, not, um, uh, not in a sort of omnipotent way that there's no way in which technologies can ever escape its grasp, but I particularly understand. when we're talking about these large technical systems built by capitalist platforms, um, it does seem to present a, a, a really challenging limit um, to what they can be, what they can be used for right now. And that's not I don't disagree. I don't, yeah, I don't disagree with that. And it, it's not to say they can't be used for other things as well, but um, it seems to imply that you have to get to some sort of post-capitalist world. Um, and I think you know your answer to the question before already suggests that you're perfectly fine with that. Um, so you know, uh, it's just sort of uh, yeah, you know, no, it's it, yeah. There's a bit of a again, like I think that you know, obviously, there's ways in which one could define capitalism that it can mean everything. And, and nothing in such a way like it's an it's an unarguable point because everything con can be con constituted this and it's easy to come back you know it's like is China capitalism is capitalism like everything becomes cap you know like the world causes the world and so it's it, it ends it can be a a kind of you know a kind of refraction sure the more specific the point the more specific that point gets the more I would I agree with it I think. Um, you know there's other it's also just as easy to come back you should be like okay but why is capitalism. Like what you know, like why is it, why did this arrange it? Like, is there not something? Are there not other things that's more sort of more fundamental in this kind of and why this capitalism, right? Modi's capitalism in India is not Xi Jinping's capitalism. It's not Texas. It's like 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 there's a, there's a great deal of variation in this as well. So anyway, I, I I think it's easy for this to kind of get stuck in a, in a maybe too much of an academic, I mean literally academic kind of discussion about eggs and chickens. Um, you know, it's clear that eggs do proceed chickens by several tens of millions of years, actually. But um, the, I, I'm not, I, again, so I, the, and it, let me, re, let me, having said that, let me stop there and, and, and ask you to like, sort of, maybe if I ask you to sort of ask a more specific question about this, that I can give a more specific and satisfactory answer. Um, well, I, I, I think we sort of, we've got, um, okay. We've got a lot out of that already, I think. Um, okay, good. I'm glad to glad to be. The first question would be: Are you secretly a Marxist? Uh, you know, that's the. <laughs> the parts of Marxism I like is the is the I like the more vulgar the better in a way. Like I the part the it's the base superstructure relationship part that I act like I'm most most 
like it's like that the that the idea that you're creating that you create that, that in a way that that is like that at a more fundamental level the conditions of socio-technical relations will are have a greater determination on the cultural operations the ideological the semiotic realm uh than the inverse uh and so that level of kind of of hardcore historical materialism i'm sign me up um I, I think what's happened though and i think you would know you know you know this quite well is that is that there is a strong idealism in a capital i philosophical idealism within a fair amount of of of, of marx's discourse that would come from a different perspective that is is to a greater or lesser degree i i think not actually as separate as it should be from the emergence of the kind of symbolic politics uh of the last of the last decade of the last decade or so as if the contestation over symbols the contestations over the contestations over symbols and signs and memes is actually a viable substitution for contestation over the things that those signs and symbols represent, uh, uh, and the ways in the way in which, uh, and, and I think this is this is just as you know this is ultimately just as self defeating uh, coming from the left as it is as it is coming from coming from the right. Yeah, yeah, no, I I, I agree. Um, yeah, so I I mean I think I think. Sorry, that's the um, I'm being summoned by the the New World Order or something. <laughs> um, so we we've got about half an hour left, and I, I don't want to sort of yeah no please yeah, um, yeah. Uh, take time away from um, the Q and A from everybody else. Um, so if other people do have questions, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I've still got um, a number of questions to ask. Uh, but maybe sort of going on what we just discussed, uh, we can look at uh, Eric's. Um, second question here, uh, which is, dear Benjamin, dear mm -hmm. Nick, uh, what do both of you think about the possibility of using slash redesigning slash building uh, that planetary scale computation for a democratically planned economy? Uh, I would be especially uh, interested in the question of political sovereignty beyond the Westphalian model in relation to that project. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you yeah. have any thoughts on that, Ben. Well, it's a big question. Um... I, I, I think it's one that I, I don't have a I don't have a party pro I don't have a plan for this uh, like I'm not, I can't give you the the ten point structure on this as well I, I think maybe what I can do is maybe to help is maybe adds can, can collaborate a little bit in the specifying what that question might entail um, there there's ways in which how do I put this there are ways in which we want to want to understand the question of 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 planetarity. Um, as something that, in a way, precedes the division and pre-organization of societies into nation states, that, that the astronomic planetarity and evolutionary planetarity, a biological atmospheric planetarity, that 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 the the sort of disclosure and revelation of a planetary condition, which is, I think, really accelerates in the last last half of the 20th century and becomes more acute in the 21st century, um, that things that we might take as a phenomenal world uh, in the Heideggerian sense are, are a poor substitute for uh, a, a, a real situated understandings of, 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 one, of one's place. Um, I, I am, you know, I, I think that I'll sort of cut to the chase here. Like, I, I think one of, in just in terms of specifically on the political question, a move towards a more explicit form of planetary scale politics is probably not only inevitable, but something that we should be um, that we should be entertaining uh, entertaining uh, immediately. Whether whether we mean this either in a democracy of ends or a democracy of means, like there's ways in which we might think of democracy in terms of you know, the more that we can distribute decision making capacity in the voice in in in, in, in voice the better and the more democratic the outcome and the better and the greater the distribution of power in that society will be it is 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 one way of, of looking at this there's another way of looking at this that like what are the, what is the mechanism for decision making composition and the durability of the effects of those decisions that will result in a democratic access to goods and services and 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 a high standard of living and democratic action. This as well, like the old adage that uh, it takes an authoritarian to make a democratic space. 
coming from architecture, like the clearing of Central Park or the clearing of a plaza, like the most democratic spaces in a city are often ones that were made by some kind of authoritarian fiat in order to clear themselves out. All of which to say is this delinking of means and ends is something that we need to keep in mind in relationship to what we're even talking about when we're talking about this as well. There's, you know, public plumbing, public infrastructure. These are ways in which you have a, you, you don't want to have to vote on every day. Uh, you don't want there to be a people's assembly of water provision to decide whether or not water will show. You want the decision to be made and made by people who understand how it works uh, and will, you know, have a degree, like not the lawyers, uh, not the lawyers deciding, but that the, the, but that the, once the decision becomes encoded, it be, you have this general provision of, of access to the, to the, to this mechanism. And so there's a question of what I just, to be sure, like how we're defined, what we mean by this when we're defining the, defining this in the in the first place. To the planetary politics thing, let me kind of suggest, you know, one of the things I talk a little bit about in the book is, you know, you look at someone like Steve Bannon, who is obviously a totally reprehensible character, but one of the things that he he recognized uh, and and tried to tried to do. Um, was understood that in many cases politics is not, you know, not only culture is upstream of politics in his line of thinking, I don't agree, but, but that politics is already international or already planetary in scope, that a populist nationalist movement in the United States is connected to one in Russia, is connected to one in Czechoslovakia, is connected to one in the Philippines, that, that this, this wave of right-wing populism is not a national issue. Uh, it, is a, it is already, it is a global political movement. And so you have this weird situation where you have a guy who is basically arguing for localist, ethno-nationalist, small, enclosed, traditionalist societies, but is producing this highly integrated internationalist movement in order to bring this about. Whereas on the left, you have people who might be arguing for a much more, uh, a, a, for a kind of internationalism, a kind of equitable global distribution of capital and access labor between global north and global south, a kind of suspicion of borders, um, a suspicion, a, a, a distrust of ethno-nationalism, uh, who have a planetary vision in, in, in mind, but are, or, but are, but have decided to organize this around and sometimes intensely localized, immediate, uh, co uh, co national or even council scale kinds of kinds of politics, and this mismatch is is quite stark. Is quite stark, uh, and I'm not sure which is actually more, uh, actually more more peculiar. Oh, oh, let me also just to sort of, if I get sort of a little bit of the point that the 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 what I'm not arguing for is that if we were to create some kind of vastly omniscient and properly calibrated planetary scale robot god, that we would not have to have politics anymore because it would decide all of these things for us, which I've heard also uh, said about some of my some of these some of these some of these kinds of pro some of these kinds of propositions. Um, the question really, you know, one way to think about it is in terms of the future of cli how climate science can become increasingly politicized. Climate science is planetary scale computation. Right now, we have the situation where it doesn't actually act back upon the thing that it's modeling. You have this dynamic, fragile climate. We are modeling it very, very accurately, but this model is not able to actually act back upon the thing that's being modeled in any way that's effective. This is quite different than financial models, where you have financial models, also a form of planetary scale computation, make quite sophisticated models of the past, present, future of particular kinds of markets or trades and different kinds of equity structures. But those actually, in weird ways, are do bend back onto those markets and transform those markets, bend them in the image of the modeling itself. And the, the question is, how do we make the models recursive? How do we make them? And how it, it is an important question. But also, you know, what are we making models of, and how are we con how are we constructing it in, in, in this in, in 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 this sense? But the bigger question for governance, you know, more generally, is is inseparable from any of this. Like, we how do we how do we ensure that Earth like life remains viable on Earth for you know for as long as possible? How how is the deep time of the future possible? What is the what is the what is the, the molecular, biological, biochemical economy that would actually allow for that long, for that long, for that long term viability? The question of the political is at best a means towards that end. Uh, 
Uh, and so uh, I think it needs to be understood within that. And the question of the, the democratic process is a means within the means towards that end. Um, if I may, I mean, sort of building yep. on precisely what you said, I think, um, you know, one question I had when I was reading the book was, um, why speak of the planetary rather than more sort of traditional ideas like the global? Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't quite clear to me um, what your sort of issue was with these more traditional ideas. I think the, the international is quite clear why there's issues with that. Um, but, you know, why particular, uh, why especially the planetary? Well, there's sort of two modes of the plan. I mean, I, to me, the, I mean, the global has come to imply, you know, I'm, I'm drawing on work from a number of people, some of whom are rather far than my own, you know, Gautry Spivak's invocation of the planetary, Akhil Mbembe, number, a, a number of others who sort of working on this as well. And I, I speak of the planetary kind of in two modes. There's a, a mode of the planetary that we might call a kind of astronomic mode, that is the, the planetarity that, that Earth sciences reveals to us, that, that there is no outside, that, you know, the pale blue dot, um, all, 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 all of this, or the black hole image for that matter, but rather this sort of, this understanding as, as we are the, we are for better or worse, the primary sapient species uh, on this earth, that, that even our own intelligence and our own capacity for sapience is something that has emerged from this planetary condition itself. That our, our capacity for intelligence and abstraction is, is itself, something that is expressed by this planetary. The planet has folded itself in such a way that it produces this creature capable of these forms of abstraction that are capable of using technology to do things like fig figure out how old the earth is itself. One way, this understanding the planetarity as a kind of underlying precondition for the possibility of not only action, but of thought itself, um, it is, a, is, is, is a first kind of philosophical move that comes here. I think, you know, it's related to the kind of Darwinian, uncomplete Darwinian term. It's related to neuroscience, related to everything else. There's then the condition of the planetary, which I, which I speak to, which refers to the kind of the need for the composition now of a viable planetarity that we, we've lived through in the last th three or 500 years, a kind of headless, planless uh, uh, process of terraforming, like emerge, you know, planless emergence has had its way. And we have terraformed the earth in the image of, of nothing. We've terraformed the earth in the image of, 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 of things that have put the entire, the, the prior condition of that planetarity at risk. And so there's a planetarity that essence that is disclosed. And there's a planetarity that is, that is before us as a comp, as in essence, a kind of compositional project. The question of whether or not the I would sort of emphatically hold that the anthropogenic response, that the, that the response to anthropogenic climate change will need to be as anthropogenic itself. Uh, and so the, the, this linking, if you like, between the planetarity that is revealed, that, that makes sapience possible, and then a sapience that in essence like comes to this awareness at a moment when it realizes that it itself was one of the chief actors that caused all this damage that now it has to fix, that that's, there's a rotation of this sapience towards this compositional project that, that the viability can continue long-term. That's what I mean by planetarity. The global, I would reserve for a much more, much less profound kind of perspective. Like it represents a kind of static, single scalar view of, uh, of a sort of planet as a frozen synchronic arrangement of Mercator nation states subdivided by longitude and latitude and viewed from some kind of transcendental elsewhere. Um, they're really, I think the globe is might say a particularly, a particular form of planetary thought, but one that is um, one that's comparatively impoverished. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we'll turn to the Q and A here as well, because we're, we're sort of running short on time. Uh, we've got a question from Sebastian uh, regarding the constitutional process in Chile. How can these ideas about data production, planetary computation, and surveillance be enacted into material politics? Uh, is it necessarily a remodeling of the state itself, or can they live together? Well, I, I'm trying to make the point that they are forms of material politics. It's not that there is these technical kind of systems over here, and then there's this political system over here, and how does one, what is the proper relationship between them? I, I think that's, in a way, 
part of why we've arrived at this particular problem is 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 as an understanding of, of a kind of false autonomy of the political and a false autonomy of the technical, um, which leaves us with nothing but technological determinism or political determinism. Um, if if that point wasn't if the, if if I if that point wasn't it wasn't it wasn't explicit enough. Um, I, I do think that they represent a transformation in the state. I don't necessarily, that's not necessarily a positive thing, but it, that's not also not a hypothetical thing. Um, you know, states, you know, one aspect of the sort of Foucauldian perspective that I would, would hold on to is the idea that states evolve in relationship to what they can see. They evolve in relationship to what, how, the, the, how as an institution they're able to produce models of the world. But I mean, that's also Weber's point about the construction of the state as a bureaucratic entity. It, it, the state has been modeled, at least in the post-Westphalian era, and particularly in the modern era, as an infor information production and rationalization machine for quite some time. But it, and, and many of the changes in the structure of the state have been driven by changes in the technological capacities of states to sense and model and see the world in different, in different ways. Um, which I doesn't need to, does is not a technological determinism, but it's just a kind of an understanding of the the distribution of, of, of the distribution of forces at work. But to the more specific point around planetary scale computation, I mean, one of the points that I sort of I think is more clear in the in the stack book has to do with the relationship between cloud with the, what I call the cloud layer and cloud platforms and the state. And 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 in many ways, what I was arguing way back then in 2015 when the when the book first came out. Um, was that cloud platforms are increasingly taking on more and more of the role of states in terms of, you know, cartography, currency, the de facto organizations of, 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 of social relations, and are doing so in a way that is that is transnational. But the argument, which, which was sort of accepted at the time, the, the other argument that I was making just as emphatically, which I think was less, less well heard, um, was the argument that states were in a way all also evolving into cloud platforms, that, that states, that the structures and anatomy of a state was becoming increasingly dependent upon the cloud as a basis for its ability to sense the world and continue to operate as a kind of information processing machine as Weber had identified long ago. And I think what we see since then has borne that out. We've seen a kind of fragmentation in China or the United States or, or you know, calls for kind of European sovereignty around data um, is a kind of fragmentation into kind of multipolar hemispherical stacks where the, the multipolarity of geopolitics and the multipolarity of the stacks that these different hemispheres are producing um, are not just related to each other. They are to a certain extent coterminous. They're the same thing. Uh, there's this, the same thing with each other. Um, so for sure that this represents a transformation within the state. Um, but it, I would also just emphasize the point that the question of governance that I put forth in the book mm -hmm. is not only about the state. It's not only about things that states do. It has to do with all of the ways in which societies, planetary, locals, urban scale, are able to sense and model and act back upon themselves and compose themselves with due deliberateness. That is not just something states do, um, but it, it is an underlying reality that will transform what states are. Yeah, so we've got another question here. Um, in the beginning, you said that not all the world is a text, uh, which I understand to be an implicit critique of postmodernism. Do you think capitalism will become modernist again? And if so, how could that come about via China, possibly? I, well, it, it, I suppose it's a critique of a kind of postmodernism. It's a critique of what, what I think is the primary postmodern movement of our times, which is right-wing populism. Uh, it, that the idea that the world is essentially, that the, reality, that the physical reality of the world can be subordinated and constructed through a mobilization of a, a kind of an organization of, of, of narrativity uh, and uh, that, 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 that the world is grammatological in nature and that the composition of this narrative can in fact produce the world itself uh, is the basis of, I think, the kind of hyper idealist in the, you know, in the, in the capital I, not, not aspirational, but you know, idealist politics of, of Trump or Bolsonaro or, or, or Modi or, or any other kind of um, ontological charlatan uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, 
So the repeat the second part of the question. I think I, I may have misheard it. Uh, do you think capitalism will become modernist again? And if so, oh, I don't know. I don't know what this sort of means. I mean, the term modernism is also like it's it, it means so many different things in different kinds of in different kinds of ways. Like, does that it, do you mean like will the building like will, will our buildings look like Richard Neutra again, or do you mean that that some sort of sense of like a the good part of the Enlightenment in terms of a kind of ethos of of, of collective demystification and disenchantment and uh, and so, you know, uh, it will, will become a kind of some sort of basis or, or, or either this is what, like, I mean, these are all very, very different kinds of things. So I would be hesitate to give any kind of thumbs up or thumbs down kind of answer on, on that as well, because I wouldn't even know what I'm, what I would, what I wouldn't even know what I'm saying. Um, I think there's ways in which, I, let me put this, I mean, China is a place that I happen to be doing a lot of work of late. I, I have a project at, at, in Shanghai on, on the history of AI in China. Um, and looking at the very different kind of ways in which even the question of artificiality and intelligence is construed and constructed in the Chinese context. Um, and it's been an extraordinarily interesting kind of thing as well. It's really interesting kind of, interesting kind of project. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll, let me say two things, and I don't mean to hedge the question, but, there, but it's, it's more complicated, that, there's, that there, are, there is so much that the West can learn from the rest of the world. Uh, and particularly from ways in which Asian, a, a, it, which Asia more generally has has shifted the central, the centrality of certain kinds of questions. That anything that we can, anything that might be done to, um, to sort of collaborate on the articulation of a post-Occidental centric view of these kinds of questions of governance is going to be to is going to be to our our, our benefit. China is, I mean, there's also obviously ways in which you know. China doesn't just represent Asia, but there's lots of ways in which the, the kind of capacity for planning, the capacity for foresight, the capacity for coordination, the capacity for mobilization, um, the capacity for scale and intervention that China is has uh, has seemed to have gotten you know has gotten much be better at than many of many of the Western countries. These are all these are all things that. Western countries, Western societies would be would do better if they were better at. Um, that doesn't mean they should become Chinese in the, more in the sense, but that they there is a lot to learn in terms of this as an as a a logic of what governance can be and what governance should be. At the same time, the question of 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 what we might think of a kind of reactionary populism is a huge part of Chinese politics. The kind of you know superficial, blustery, flag waving, wolf warrior propaganda is a huge part of Chinese political culture. And, and like the idea that the world is a text that can be basically decided by by fiat is not is not something that's foreign to the that's foreign to the Chinese context as well. And so, when you ask about China, I, I would have to answer that it kind of depends on what you mean. That there's a lot to learn and a lot to be disturbed about. Great. Uh, we've got seven minutes left, so we've got uh, one more question here. Uh, All right. Hi, Benjamin. I wonder, what do you think of the general layer of analysis, planetary geopolitical governance, being shifted, pushed, or rather connected to a micro layer, uh, namely the planetary huh. genomic political one in the positive sense? Right. Uh, I'm thinking right. of messenger RNA in particular here. If the revenge of the real emerged from this micro layer, would it make sense to think of it and of the potential modes of governance within such a realm in the same sort of scale? Yes, absolutely. So yes, very much so. Like one of the other things I, I want to kind of qualify here, like I, I've tried to make the point, um, I've tried to make the point explicit, but I, I understand that the, the, where, that the term just implies scale. Like the question of the planetary for me does not just mean very, very large. Um, the planetarity per se, part of, I think, the, 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 another valence of differentiation with the global is its polyscalarity, that, that the question of planetarity includes the, you know, the, the much smaller than human, just as much as it includes the much larger than human, equally so, that it recognizes that most life on Earth is microbial, that it recognizes the role of messenger RNA and DNA as a precondition for life, that becomes the precondition for the possibility of intelligence and sapience and so forth and the rest of this. That multiscolarity and the dynamic relationships between those scales, I think is must be part of what we even mean by that planetary condition itself, not just stuff that's really big. 
Um, and so, yeah, we see, I mean, we, we've seen this not just, I mean, there's the question of the agency of viruses and so forth with, with the pandemic that's obviously been, will stay with us as a long time. But, you know, I, I, you know, I have to say like, I, there's a lot to be, there's obviously, a, you know, there's, there's a, so much to be really genuinely disturbed about, about the role of, of, of you know, the, the current state of, of capitalist biotechnology in the world. At the same time, it is also impossible not to be rather impressed by the fact that by the process by which the something, you know, some of the mRNA vaccines were produced, which were, were obviously not just, they were obviously funded over years and years and years and years and years by, by public capital. So this is the point is, is, is held. But that, you know, that you have situ where the Chinese, Chinese scientists will map the genome of the virus that post this online. The next day, scientists in Cambridge, Massachusetts will download a digital model of the genome of the virus. They produce a digital model of a vaccine candidate for the virus, bioprint that vaccine candidate in the whole process taking about 48 hours. That that's was the cycle of Moderna's vaccine that many of us have in our, I'm, I'm team Pfizer, but the, the other that many of us have going around in this as well. Um, this is an extraordinary. This is extraordinary. Like th this, this. I think part of the the strangeness of this moment is that we're at one where it's clearly that that kind of mobilization of resources and intelligence and process is uh, we are that is we're clearly capable of this, and at the same time, simultaneously, we are also incapable of of distributing tests, incap in incapable of having an equitable testing regime incapable of convincing people that the virus is not going to, you know, it doesn't have 5G in it, uh, incapable of distributing, you know, proper, you know, the, the proper supplies to you know, countries in, in the global south. It's the simultaneity of this tremendous capacity for tremendous capacity and tremendous incompetence at different scales and in different registers at the same time. Um, that I, I think we need to take, we need to really sort of be very clear, like, like that, that's, that, that is the condition itself is this, is this bizarre simultaneity uh, without sort of, and, and, under, and, and understanding that, the, that somewhere in the mixture and algebra of those juxtapositions, there are going to be some lines of flight out of it. Great. Um, I think that's a good place to end. Um, All right. Interesting discussion. So thank you, Benjamin, for for all those very thorough and uh, interesting answers. Thanks, um, Nick, for very much for, for, for posing them, yeah. Uh, and thank you everybody as well for, for joining us and asking your questions. Um, hopefully everybody else enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and yeah, go buy a copy of the book. It's a fascinating little piece uh, and very breezy read. Um, yeah, plenty to, to get from it. Thank you, thanks. So yeah, thanks Nick again for, for uh, taking the time to, to kind of, to kick the ball back and forth on this uh, on this as well can't have, I really really appreciate it thanks for everyone for joining and I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation with with all of you thanks to housemans and diverso for for hosting this so um, onward we go thank you.